this is you starting in your first year, you're going to be drilled a lot of stuff into your brains for the next three, four years. And in some ways, how we structure, how we remember, very much determines where we're going to be and how we're going to determine and, and discuss things with, with other people. And just a brief reminder, I won't talk about memory much, uh, but it is an important thing um, that memory does have several characteristics that we can both be in control of and not in control of. Um, and there are five sort of big ones important for us. First of all, is that it's, it's very visual. We think in terms of patterns, and that's one thing I would like to really talk about today, is that when you are imagining the world around you, or when you're digesting a problem, you actually sort of have an image, have a mental relationship of how things, things are done. Um, memory is also emotional, in a sense that we remember times, um, situations in which we remember something. We can also get totally blocked when we are in a situation where we're emotionally unstable uh, and we cannot access memories or cannot remember things. Um, memory is also very structured or patterned. Whenever you see something, when you remember it, you create a pattern of things that, that make sense to you, create meaning out of it. Um, it's also limited. We're not hard drives. And our short-term memory, there's a magical number seven uh, in terms of remembering things that we can keep in our mind between five and nine items at a time. So when you're trying to juggle a lot of things, and it's 20 of them, you may want to sort of cluster them together just to be able to handle that. And finally, memory is habitual in a sense that you do need to reinforce it. The steps <coughs> after steps after steps, doing things and building on stuff. Now what happens when you apply all of the stuff, this is what we do when we learn, uh, we literally encode information into our brains. We, it changes the way we think. And this is a beautiful example from biology. Uh, do, is anybody doing biology? All right, quite a few people. So this is a beautiful example of actually using all these characteristics to teach you. There's no cell in the world that actually literally looks like this. This is a diagram, but it's a mnemonic tool to help you use the, especially the visual characteristic of memory, to remember things. Because when you're trying to recall stuff, if you have an image, it's gonna be easier. You can remember, okay, there was a vacuole in the middle, there was a mitochondria up top right, things like that. So this is a way of encoding. And in some ways, to approach how we think about stuff and how we do vertical thinking has very much to do with how we memorize. And I'll just give you an example from, this is about 500 years ago. Uh, if you went to university, um, especially in Germany in the 1500s, you would actually take a class on memorizing things. Uh, and this is when printing was just starting, but people were really crazy about memorizing things because it meant that you can really capture a lot of information. Um, and one of the things you could be memorizing is what they call mnemonic alphabets. And in order to learn new things, what you would do is to remember literally letters attached to visual, strong visual images. And then if you saw something new, you could use that alphabet to recall, to, to, to create a sort of visual bond. So we have A is a compass looking thing, B is a yoke for oxen, C is a bow, D is a bo uh, looks like bull's head for some reason. E is an anchor, and so on. And so let's say I meet someone called Eve, and I could think of an apple, that would be a nice mnemonic, but let's say I wanna remember her name using this alphabet. I could think of this gorgeous girl, and she's going to have an anchor through her head, and a, uh, s her throat will be sliced with a razor, and another anchor. It's very bloody and very gory, but it's actually a very visual way of remembering something. So whenever you see her, you see this gorgeous girl with an anchor through her head, and it's, that's Eve, and it's gonna recall you that. So what, the, what this did was provide people with very, very efficient way of thinking and remem remembering things, but it also really sort of rigidly froze things in a certain way of thinking. Um, another tool which is extremely efficient, it's uh, what people call mnemonic backgrounds. Have you ever heard this kind of thing before? Okay, so you can remember a whole deck of cards if you're into that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And you'll, I guess you'll hear about this later on today. Um, you can make a lot of money, I guess. But uh, essentially what a mnemonic background is, is use, taking advantage of the visual characteristic of memory to store things so you can later access them. And this is, has to do with just being able to work with a lot of things, remember them so you can access them uh, flexibly. Um, and the most efficient one is literally a space that you're very familiar with. So let's say you have a study you know very well. When you want to remember a lot of stuff, you could literally locate those things in the corners or in the places in the room. And that way, when you're trying to recollect them, you don't just have a dead list of things. You can literally walk through the room and use that room as a, as a foundation, as a skeleton. Does it make sense? So uh, just a little exercise. We've got a bit of time. We could do this. Um, let's, let's come up with eight things that we want to remember, just for the hell of it. 
And we can use this space, let's pretend this is our study. We can sort of locate them in the corners and see how we can remember that, use that to, uh, to help ourselves. Any, any eight things that come to mind? Turtle. What was it? Turtle. Turtle, beautiful. There was another thing? Just just yell at me. Eight. Handcuffs. Turtle, eight. <laughs> Handcuffs. I see where your minds are this morning. Okay. F five other things. Coffee. Coffee. <laughs> yep, four more things. Cow. 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 Okay. Runners. runners. Yeah. What's a runner? A oh, runners. It's shoes? Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two more things. Glass. Glass. And there was one hand up? Oh, you're just practicing the cuffs? Okay. <laughs> one more thing. One more thing. Pineapple. Pineapple. So w what we're going to do is try to use the, the visual characteristic of memory to literally anchor things into this room. So uh, let's pretend we know this room very well. And what we'll start with, there's four corners on the bottom. So we have a corner here where the trash can is, corner where the door is, corner where this computer is, there's another corner where this bag is. So we have one, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, and eight. So what we can do is literally start locating these things in the places. So in the trash can right there, or behind the trash can, is a big turtle trying to rumble around very, very slowly, almost knocking the trash can over. So right there is a turtle. Number two is going to be egg. There's a bunch of eggs in the corner. Actually, what the turtle wants is to get to those eggs so she can eat them. Uh, number three is handcuffs. That's a good one. Uh, <laughs> let's imagine that uh, somebody's just sort of tied me here with the handcuffs in the corner and I can't get out and I just keep talking on and on and on. So it's the handcuffs right here. Um, number four is coffee. Right here where Rowan is, she has a gigantic cup of coffee and she's just really relaxing and enjoying the morning coffee. Um, in this corner right up there, is a hole in the ceiling and there's a cow mooing through and, and trying to get into the turtle and the eggs. Um, hanging off this corner here are runners. So we have, let's just imagine something vivid, very smelly old runners hanging by there. We don't want to connect them all together because that could be get complicated. We want to separate them in different places. But if you can think of a cow wearing the runners and her head is sticking out this way and her feet are sticking out that way, <laughs> you go for it. So we have cow and the runners, then we have a glass right up here. Above the handcuffs is a glass with full of water and it's maybe sort of dripping down uh, just to make it vivid. And finally, we have a pineapple uh, hovering over Rowan with her coffee is, is a big, beautiful pineapple. Okay, so let us, I'm just gonna flip this over and let's see if this worked in terms of locating things. So what is item number one? Number two? Number three? Number four? Number five, yeah. six, Runners. seven. <laughs> That's a good one, actually, because it's, it's a difference. How you, how you encode things actually makes a humongous difference on how you take it back. So when you think of glass full of water, if the water ends up being stronger, then you get in trouble because you're remembering the wrong thing. So it's good to remember what, what you want. So we have glass and the last one. What is the fifth thing from the end? From the end. Coffee, it'll be the fourth item actually. If we take the last three items in reverse order, what would they be from the end? You got it. So what this does for us is literally help us create a skeleton or a foundation for things we want to remember. And even if you forget one or two of them, you can always go around and actually pick them up. Now the reason why I'm doing this, because first of all, it's a fun exercise, but also because it does give you a sense that whatever we do, in some ways, we encode in very, very firm way. And when you want to remember this list in another way, it's going to be actually quite a bit difficult to do because you have to restock your, your images. And it's just one example. Whatever we re remember, f in some ways, works the same way. Now, if you went, again, to back to school 400, 500 years ago, uh, and let's say you wanted to become a preacher for some reason, uh, you would actually have to memorize your Bible. And that's a pretty thick book, if you know. Um, and one of the things that they would do to help themselves is to literally create these kinds of mnemonic backgrounds. There'll be images attached to chapters so you can recall them and in your mind go through these images. Uh, so what we have here is literally, this is a book of John and John's symbol is the eagle. This chicken thing look, is actually an eagle. And so it's attached in your mind to this idea of an eagle. 
And what we have is the first lines of this book. So we have, in the beginning was the word the Trinity. So we have the little dove there and the three heads, that's the Trinity up on top. Number two would be there was a marriage in Cana. Uh, number three, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was known to be reborn, so there's actually sort of a vagina image here, which is very vivid. Then we have four, Jesus asked the Samaritan woman for a drink at the well, so we have a bucket of the well and so on. And this way you literally go through your background and remember things and tie them to those structures. Now this can be extremely powerful and they would literally build in their minds palaces of memory. We have images of images of images. And in some ways, what we do when we study, we create identical structures of, of things that we remember and build on. Uh, they don't have to be purely geometrical or follow the laws of nature because they can connect in all kinds of funky ways, but they are tied together. They're held together um, as, as memories. And it's very difficult to break through them um, because it determines how you approach things. And uh, in some ways, I don't know if you've seen this example um, of uh, identifying parrots. We tend to think in ways that we're adjusted. This is what we study. This is what we know. And when you see something new, you're reading it through your paradigm, through the way you're used to it. And of course, if you think of birds, you're going to have um, a female that's always sort of duller than the male. And if bird species looks like this, there's no way this could be the same species, of course. And so this is the Eclectus parrot. And really, until the early 20th century, they assumed these were different species. And they tried to breed males and males and females and females. And th they were not very lucky with, with that until they really observed that actually this is the bright female and this is the male. Um, and they had to literally change the way they thought in order to be able to proceed to do things. There was a question? Okay.